When you're 82 years old and you've already paddled the entire length of the Mississippi River in 80 days, what do you do for an encore? Tonight on The Best Times, we talk with Dale Sanders, the oldest person to hike the Appalachian Trail. Funding for The Best Times is provided by the Plough Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. Every scientific study I've ever read underscores the importance of exercise as we age. Even the simplest of exercises, walking, can lower the risk of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, and type 2 diabetes, while strengthening bones and muscles, burning calories, and lifting your mood. You're about to meet a man who is a living example of what exercise can do for our aging bodies. His name is Dale Sanders, and he goes by the moniker of the Greybeard Adventurer. Hey, how you guys doing? Throughout Dale Sanders' life, he was always looking for the next adventure. In the Navy, he was a hard hat diver, a notoriously dangerous assignment. In the 60s, he was a champion spear fisherman and once held the record for underwater breath holding at just over six minutes. In 2015, at age 80, Dale set out in a specially rigged canoe in an attempt to become the oldest person to paddle the entire length of the Mississippi River, from a source in Minnesota to the Gulf of Mexico a distance of over 2,300 miles. Kind of difficult paddling now in this wind and rain. Look here, we all decked out. I'm the only one on the water really right now. This is what it looks like. After 80 days of paddling, Dale completed his journey. I know that more, the more I exercise and the more I participate, especially outdoor activities, the, the happier I am. I'm speaking to the generation before me, 50s and 60s. Those people, if they, if they prepare themselves now, like I did, they will be and they can be doing the same things I'm doing now at 80 and 81. Well, now Dale can add one more world record to his name because in 2017, at the age of 82, he became the oldest person to through hike the 2,190 mile Appalachian Trail. Dale, uh, let's begin before you, before you took a single step on the trail. Tell me about how you developed, how and why you developed this idea. A couple of years ago, I, at 80 years old, I paddled the Mississippi River and uh, I ended up getting a record there. I turned out to be, I was the oldest person ever through hike the entire Mississippi River from source, 2,400 miles to the Gulf of Mexico, so source to sea. And uh, after that adventure, I just really wanted to do something else in the same, same category, get another world record. I carried that same theme on into my next adventure, and that what the next adventure turned out to be the Appalachian Trail, which I'd had on my bucket list oh, really? my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> so it was only natural you would choose It was something. just sort of a natural that, and I also got so much attention from media attention from the being old and doing something <laughs> for the kids on the Mississippi River paddle that I could just visualize if I can hike the Appalachian Trail, that'll be a big deal. What, what kind of training did you do to get you ready for this 22, nearly 2200 mile trail? Well, I basically was not a hiker, so I had to train. I was, I was a paddler, 
So uh, about 10 months, close to a year, before I started to hike, I started training. Full backpack, walking. Shelby, Shelby uh, Forest was my favorite place around here to hike because it does have some hills. They're, mm -hmm. they're short, but you can go back and forth on those hills. You can have pretty decent training. So for 10 months, I walked the Shelby, Shelby Forest trails and gotten prepared for it. Had I not done that, I doubt very seriously if I'd have made it the first month. You mentioned the backpack. Let's talk about the gear that you took with you. How did you make the choices that you made of what to put in the backpack? First of all, how much did it weigh? Well, I got a full backpack with me today, and uh, it weighs right at 22 pounds, just a little bit less. And that's got food for three days and water and everything I needed to survive. I could walk out that door right now and go out into the wilderness and live for, for three days with what I've got there. It, since it weighs only 22 pounds, I had, this, I had to have things to live with on the trail, food, tents, you know, a tent, sleeping bag, things. And I can tell you what. If it was lightweight, and I pretty much went with the lightweight name brand equipment. Good choice, Pearly. Emergency gear, uh, first aid, so forth. I carry with. a few things uh, first aid with me, not a lot, but band-aids are very important, the sport kind that you mm -hmm. they won't come off and, you know, when you get wet so much. And I, I, I carry an ace bandage, and, and that's, that's... So uh, not so much. Not, not so really. much. I, uh, maps, GPS? Uh, yes, there is a, there's a very good booklet of hard maps that most people, they just rip out the page just so they don't have to carry all the way to the book. Uh, and they carry that with them so they can got, follow the trail uh, all the way through. But in my case, I use a, a program that's uh, computer-based on my smartphone. Mm -hmm. And just right here, it was right here, and that saved my life many times, having that on-base gut hook program. It's called gut hook. It's an app we can download. Wow. It's a free app. And, and you kept your phone tied to you so it didn't Yeah, fall away if from I sit you. down, I don't want to run off. That's <laughs> exactly right. If it falls That's out right. sitting on a log and I take off, I still got it. Well, don't ever let anyone tell you Connecticut is easy. Because I don't know whether you can see that one figure down there or not, but there's one coming up from way down there. And then we got this cliff here. And then I got to go on up somewhere up there to the top. Talk about a little bit about what you thought before the trip your greatest challenges would be. Well, to be honest with you, I doubt it very seriously if I would be able to make it. Really? Because I figured that my chances were so slim getting through it without having an accident that took me off the trail, or a sickness that took me off the trail. Uh, it, it, if one in five make it, and, though, and most of the people hike it are in their 20s. <laughs> so my chances were very slim to get through this trail. So I really doubted that I would be able to make it. That was, that was a real challenge for me. Piece of cake! All right, if we're talking we talk about challenges, what, what were your greatest fears that you had? Uh, well, well, my greatest fear was not being able to, is injury or sickness, not being able to continue hiking because uh, but I had some other psychological fears like I thought I would not be accepted by the other hikers. Because they're so, so young. Yeah. Because I'm so yeah. young, yeah. 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 <laughs> because they're so young and you're so <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. As it turned out, one of the biggest surprises and probably the biggest surprise is that I was not only accepted, but I was in that subculture. The Appalachian Trail definitely has its own subculture. <laughs> but I was not only accepted in that subculture, but I was honored and held up with great esteem. And I, I, it, I became so well known on the trail that this is really emotional to be given the respect that those young kids gave me. You mentioned the young hikers on the trail because the average age that I read for a through hiker is about 25 years old. So you're, you've got almost 60 years 
on, uh, on those hikers. Did age play a role other than, I mean, you mentioned obviously uh, your physical condition and so forth, but did, did age play another role? Medication, for example, you, have, you had to take medication with you. Well, I obviously had to carry medication, many more medications than the younger folks had to carry and, and have to take those medications too. And you, you got you to take a supply with you. So getting medications was very difficult, you know, getting prescriptions refilled and that type thing. Near the summit. Now, you didn't do this hike in a linear fashion. You didn't go from south to north, north to south. You, you no. did sort of what they call the yeah. flip-flop route. Explain yeah, I that. did a flip-flop. I started, I started in Springer Mountain, Georgia, going to, I was supposed to be uh, finishing in Katahdin in Maine. Uh, so I, I hiked through and a little bit above the halfway point. I decided that in order for me to be able to make it over the Maine mountains, and to get up to Katahdin in the central Maine before the snows and before the cold set in to go ahead and do what they call, and it's encouraged by the Appalachian Trail, do a flip-flop. I went, so I, from that point in Boiling Springs, Pennsylvania, I went overland and hiked to the top of Mount Katahdin, which is the northern terminus, and then turned around and hiked back to Boiling Springs. This is a typical section of a lot of places on the AT, rocks. You can see the white blazes there. Actually, you can see two of them. The trail goes right through these rocks. It's really hard to see where it is. It's so difficult unless you just watch, keep your eyes on where your foot is going to land every single step. Otherwise, you're going to fall. Give me a, a, a sense of a typical day on the trail for you. What was it like? I would pack the night before. I'd get everything ready. I would even lay out my breakfast in the morning that I wasn't going to take on the trail and get everything for it. I, mean, I would try to get in bed uh, in the evening. I would try to be laying down by 7 o'clock if possible and try to get to sleep around 8 because I would at 4 o'clock when the alarm went off, I was up. <laughs> You're ready to go. <laughs> and I was on the trail usually uh, bef well before daylight. And uh, I would stop and usually stop mid-morning and have a snack, stop at lunch, eat a lunch, stop mid-afternoon, have a snack, and then finish on out. Tr I tried to finish the mileage that I was going to hike that day. I would try to get out by 3 o'clock, but many, many, many times I didn't get out until dark. Did you have a target mileage for each day, an average you wanted to hit? I tried to stay between 15 and 20 miles per day, but you, ha you have to have a place to stop on the other end. Exactly, You've got to have yeah. a trailhead. So the, the actual mileage I was going to hike that day, depending on where the trail, the next trailhead was. Yeah. And does the difficulty of the terrain come into play? And in Oh my gosh. The, well? most, a lot of people don't realize that uh, the Appalachian Trail goes through 14 states. <laughs> and through those states, it's following the mountains, uh, the Eastern Continental Divide. Well, they don't call it the Appalachian Trail for nothing. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's following the Eastern Continental Divide, so it's in the most rugged conditions you can imagine. I'm following Right now, we talked, you mentioned falls, and you had some falls, which, was, which was one of your main times. worries going into this. <laughs> so, uh, tell, there was one particularly bad one, though, wasn't there? I only had one hard fall, and it was, it was really hard. It was in the White Mountains. I was coming down uh, Kinsman Mountain, which is a very difficult 22 mile between trailheads. So, you've got to go 22 miles to get through there if you want to do it in one day. And I was coming down the mountain, and it was raining, and it was very steep, uh, something like that. <laughs> and uh, I, when I slipped, I put my foot on a cedar pole. They use cedar for uh, erosion control. Usually they have knots on it, and you don't, mm. but this one didn't have any knots. And it looked dry to me, but it wasn't dry. I put my left foot on it, and I was immediately down in the rocks, hard. I mean, really hard. 
I cut my hand here and here, and I think I broke that finger. But and I, I sat on the ground. I, my tracking bolts just boom, 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 kept going on down. It was that steep. But I sat there for a while and fixed my hand. And got the pain was so severe in there. I got it fixed. I stood up to start walking and fell. My left hip had been hurt. I didn't even know it. It had been hurt so badly I couldn't put any weight on it. I was halfway. I was about the 10 mile, 10 and a half mile point. And I had just, a, I had a, still had 11 miles to go to get out. And it would have been 10 and a half to go back, 11 miles to go forward. So I, I thought seriously, just to save a half mile, I might go back. But I went ahead and tried to get out. As I walked, the pain was really severe. But as I, I was able to struggle through and get down the mountain and make it to the van that evening, just that it was getting dark. Now, you also had a medical emergency out on the trail. Oh, I sure did. Now, that one took me off the trail. And in the, uh, in the Maine, in Maine, there's an area called the 100 Mile Wilderness. Well, I had to carry seven days of food because they told me it's going to take me seven days to get through there. And I had a heavy backpack, heavier than normal. And uh, uh, I, I had had a head cold and it had been a, it was a real bad one. I was just barely getting over it, and I got constipated really badly. And here I am on the trail trying to get rid of a cold. And, and uh, I noticed that I kept getting weaker and weaker. It wasn't until I had an opportunity to to flag a boat down and go across the lake to to a hostel on the other side of the lake to spend the night. And when I went to the toilet instead of the the latrines, I noticed that there was blood in the stool. Mm -hmm. And I'd been, and I don't know how long I'd been bleeding, but I, I was already weak. And, and there's another situation where I was debating as whether I can continue. Or I had some high mountains coming up, but I, I wanted to, I wanted to get through the hundred mile wilderness. And I went on up and I went over the White Cap Mountain range. But I was almost crawling when I went over the top of White Cap. It was, I was so weak. And then as soon as I got out of the 100 mile wilderness, I went straight to, to, to a doctor's office in a hospital. And uh, they did a lab test, and a few tests, and found out that uh, I, needed, uh, I needed some medication. And they gave me the medication, and I stayed and rested for four days up in Maine. Didn't do anything. It still kept bleeding. So then I decided to come, to my, come home to, uh, to my colonoscopy doctor to see what to do. And, as it turns out, I had had uh, a history of internal hemorrhoids, and, and uh, the constipation had ruptured one of the large hemorrhoids, and it just wouldn't stop bleeding, and I was almost bleeding out. Did you think about quitting? At I that thought point? seriously about quitting. Now that was, I, I thought about quitting almost every day. <laughs> <laughs> it was more difficult. Another surprise was it was more difficult than I originally anticipated to be. Thinking back on it, I don't know how I was able to get muster up the strength. But after a few days, I'd rested five days up there. I rested five days here in Memphis, and then I drove back up, and that took me two days. So I went back on the trail and started off slow in Maine. And uh, actually, I started down to White Mountains because I needed to do that section. Start, started in the Whites and uh, built myself back up and, and was able to... Uh, go back up to Maine then and come back down to the Whites and finish out in Pennsylvania. Wow. Uh, along the trail, now this is, you know, this is the wilderness. Did you worry about wild animals at all? Uh, I wasn't uh, worried about anything wild other than humans. <laughs> I was, I watch where I can because of humans though. But we would have to, at night, we would have to put our food up in the trees and with the bears and things like that. And speaking of bears, I saw three bears uh, on the trail. Hi, mommy bear. I'm just going to pass. That's all I'm going to do, girl. You're just going to have to let me pass, okay? Don't eat me. I don't taste good. I see two little ones going up the tree. So I walked and went down behind the cliff, and as soon as I went out of sight, you know what she did? What? She ran over right to the edge of the cliff, which is only almost right at reaching the <laughs> And I looked up, and there she was right there, just sitting there looking at me, just like this, and watching me. 
she just, you know what happened, I think? She, even though I was singing to her and talking to her, she lost sight of me. As soon as she ran over and she saw I wasn't a threat to the cubs behind her, then she didn't jump on me. And I just, I tried to get a movie of it, but I, I couldn't. I was a little bit shaken. I bet you I were. I couldn't get the movie on. <laughs> I bet you were a little shaken. But that's what I would it? do. I'd sing to the bears. Hi, Mama Bear. <laughs> I'm not going to hurt you. Don't eat me. I don't <laughs> taste good anyway. Well, now you've got two age-based records, 80 on the Mississippi and now 82 on the Appalachian Trail. Um, what's your key to staying healthy at that age? That's a good question. Uh, I think a lot of the reasons why I'm healthy is I've just been, simply been active my entire life. And I've been blessed to not have any, any diseases. But anybody that's blessed with not having too, too many disease issues uh, can do the same things I did. And, and I had sort of, I have a little formula that I use. And I, I, I believe in, in uh, one has to stay happy. And I, when I'm saying happy, I mean, just don't be tense and relax and if, just sort of let the water off, run off. It's like <laughs> running off of a duck's back, you know. Just stay happy. And I can't tell anyone what the formula for being happy is. They have to figure that out. And, but I believe if you're going to be truly happy, and true happiness will, I think, help ward off diseases as well. I think one needs a, a positive spiritual life. And, uh, and I, I'm not me. I'm not... I don't believe in the extremes on either end of the spiritual life, but a good, solid spiritual life. And the third ingredient that I believe one has to do is stay active. And that I'd been doing as well my entire life. I mean, when I, I'm not knocking the gym, <laughs> but one has to get out of the gym and get outside and bicycle or swim or hike, canoe or kayak or something in order to stay active. It's got to be more than the gym can offer. Well, certainly your formula has worked so it, far. It, it will work for me. Notice yeah. I didn't mention food. That's right. You didn't. Well, because I, I, I believe a variety of food is really important. And I tell you, there's a lot of good foods out there. And I'm, I don't place a lot of emphasis on uh, as long as I eat a good quality food. I eat a great variety of foods. And that includes meat. For me, anyway. Yeah. And I think it, that's essential. All right. Uh, Mississippi River, Appalachian Trail, which one was harder? Oh, there's no question about it. Now, absolutely, the Mississippi was the walk in the park compared to the <laughs> walk in the woods <laughs> or the mountains. Or the I've never heard of a 2,000-plus mile trip down the Mississippi as a walk in the park. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, in the boat, you can stop paddling and you're still going to be going down river. Float. If you stop walking, you're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. You've got these two records. Have you got something else in mind? Yes, I have. What? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I've been asking, even on Facebook, I asked for people to give ideas. I got hundreds of <laughs> ideas. Uh, so many of them, several times, several repeats. But, you know, I, I, I was really fortunate. Uh, I've been in spearfishing my entire life. And uh, been in competition. I mean, in fact, I held a world record uh, athlete of the year in, in that sport. Uh, can you believe that I got reinvited to go back into spearfishing? <laughs> and so it looks like that my next big adventure. Well, I'm going this this summer. I'm going out. I'll, I'll be working with the U.S. spearfishing team in in uh, in Utah. But uh, for 2019, it looks like that I'm going to be a team member on the master's team representing the United States in New Zealand freshwater spearfishing competition. And I'm thinking about New Zealand is it. <laughs> Never been there either. Uh, well, I wish you the best with that. Listen, when you do that, you'll have to come back on the show, uh, bring us some pictures and footage and talk about your adventure. Thank you. Dale, Appreciate thanks it. for being on The Best Times. Appreciate it.
Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.